Hello, welcome to another Tweedy Pubs video. I'm in St Albans today and also have a special guest. The Hello. entire, oh sorry, oh sorry. <laughs> should, we do, should we go again? The entire team from WC21 Brackets UK Productions Limited Hello. will be joining me on this tour of the pubs of St Albans. I think you have some familiarity with this area as well. Ah uh, yes, you? I do. I actually lived in uh, St Albans uh, in about 1988, I think. So what's that? 35 years ago, something like that. Uh, and uh, so it's going to be interesting to see what pubs I can remember from that time. I was 20, so I don't know how good the memory will be. Fantastic. So we're starting with the obvious candidate, most famous pub in St Albans, the old fighting cocks. I'm not going to call it ye. Uh, we've got off to a good start. Uh, we've got the pub bingo, some of the essential elements of pub bingo. Uh, yes, Oliver Cromwell uh, was uh, here and there are secret underground uh, tunnels as well. So not too bad on the pub bingo. I do wonder how Oliver ever managed to win that civil war, uh, given that he spent so much time in so many pubs across the whole of the country. Cheers from the old fighting cocks in St Albans. This pub lays claim to being the oldest in England and there are a handful of such claimants. They're always incredibly hard to prove and I think in this particular case the earliest records of this pub, the earliest written records, go back to about the mid 18th century, alas. The building is quite possibly early 1600s, around about 1600 almost exactly, and we believe it may have had a former use as a pigeon house, which is essentially the same thing as a dovecot, and that would explain the octagonal shape of the building. It may have been used for fighting cocks at some point in its history, and you know, as an interesting aside, now that we're here in St Albans, the one-time one site of Verulamium, the sport, if you can call it that, of fighting cocks actually was brought to Britain by the Romans. Makes you wonder, what did we actually invent? Oh, it's rolling, is it? Yeah, oh, I pressed the button here, so um, it's filming all this nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I thought we'd do a quick uh, beer review. Um, very reasonably priced, I think, here in St Albans. Two pints came in at just under £10. £9.80, was it, I think? £9.80, yep. What are you having there? So WC mine was an Adnams, one? can you remember what it was called? Broadside. An Adnams Broadside from uh, Suffolk. Very nice. No grapefruit. Great. <laughs> Definitely grapefruit free. And uh, I'm having the Old Man and the Sea. It's a stout from Mighty Oak Brewery in Malden. And that's very pleasant, actually. It's, um, it's a bit thinner and a bit lighter than Guinness, for example, but um, rich and chocolatey and very satisfying. Pretty pleased with that. Tweedy, weren't you going to say something about the beeves? And we oh, need yeah. to say it quite slowly because you've got a lot of b-roll of it. Well, um, Historic England make a point of noting that there are particularly heavy beams forming the structure of this one-time dovecot and or pigeon house and uh, hopefully we can show you some overlay of that on screen now. And uh, whilst we're looking at that, isn't there something about the cellar of this uh, pub? Don't they say that the people that want us to believe that this is the oldest pub in England, that the cellar is the proof of that? Yes, there, there was a, a claim uh, which could well be su substantiated by court records that the building had actually been moved at one time. So the current structure in its current location is around 1600. Hard though it may be to believe, this could have actually been disassembled from another part of possibly the wider Abbey grounds and moved to this location. And there was a claim that the original structure goes back to possibly even the 15th century but it's on slightly shaky grounds because the cellars as they exist here today are perfectly shaped for the shape of the current building here. So if there's any claim that this site has older cellars that pre-exist the current structure, it would just be too much of a coincidence that they would be octagonal to fit the shape of this pigeon house slash dovecot that forms the main part of the It pub. does sound like that might be, doesn't it? I'm afraid it does. Very probably. Um, yes. <laughs> But um, it's a beautiful pub in its own right. Who cares if it's the oldest pub in England or not? Um, Absolutely. And um, enjoying the beer and uh, very pleasant to be here with uh, Mr. WC21. Cheers from the uh, Lower Red Lion. Which is one, the only one now, of what was four in the past, the uh, Upper, Lower, Little and Rampant. Earliest records of this pub 
our mid 18th century, but it extends the building at least is at least 17th century. It's quite an attractive, what I would call an ingle look fireplace behind us. We were discussing just now whether that really qualifies or not. If you could definitely sit in there, there's possibly more modern brickwork. Um, it's sort of nineteen thirties type of uh, thing gone on, I think, but uh, yeah. still very, very charming. Yeah, um, and it's uh, wood panelled. Um, this is not on Camera's list of historic pub interiors, but it is a list of buildings. So Historic England have made some notes about it, which I forget the details of. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. impressionist uh, painter Sir George Clausen, R. A. Uh, painted the garden in 1884 and he was living in the area in the 1880s. He moved here so that he could paint pastoral scenes of rural folk doing things like topping turnips and gathering together bales of hay, which is obviously very much on vogue. Carrying the milk churns? Almost certainly. There were some milk churns uh, involved, uh, very popular with, uh, I, I imagine, sort of Victorian city dwellers of the day that mm. wanted to be remind, reminded of their pastoral past. Those of you who are not a fan of kids in pubs, and I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, take heed. Uh, but they do tell you where you can go. Yeah, I think that's quite considerate there. there. Yeah, it's kind. This is what Clausen painted. Not too sure if he'd be that bothered now. Wouldn't have had crazy paving in uh, Clausen's time. Farrow and Ball. <laughs> Next up, the Farrier's Arms. This pub is uh, it's quite significant, some terrible camera work here, quite significant for being the first meeting place of the Hertfordshire branch of Camera, the Campaign for Real Ale, which may not in itself sound particularly significant, but essentially St Albans is the heartland of Camera. Since the 1970s, when the organisation was formed, they've had their offices here. I believe Roger Protz also lives somewhere nearby, one of the uh, very key founding members, or at least very early members of Camera and a, a beer critic in his own right. So uh, it's a little bit of a pilgrimage in a way coming to this pub for, uh, for a Camera member. Farrier's Arms here currently has outdoor toilets, both the ladies and the gents, which is quite an unusual feature. Pubs before that I've seen that have had outdoor toilets, it's normally only an imposition that the men are expected to bear. Um, but the current landlord is talking about trying to bring these indoors. So this may be um, a, a first and last opportunity to use these outdoor facilities. Actually look to be two doors to the gents. Are they sort of individual cubicles or something? Ah oh, yes. Oh wow. <laughs> you probably don't need to see the urinals, do you? There we go. Ah, well this may soon be a thing of the past, but I think this is pretty beautiful to be honest. Uh, we got chatting to the, the new landlord there, which was fascinating. I think we've got in there, haven't we, at a sort of a pivotal point in its yeah. history. It, it has an incredible preserved sort of 1960s interior at the moment, uh, but the landlord has plans to uh, change it. Yeah, hopefully subtly and sensitively. Yeah. You know, right now, as we saw it, I think that was a... Yeah, it was um, a special moment, I a, felt. A special moment. And we, we uh, got to see the outside toilets, the outside uh, toilets. which are doomed. They are going to be gone, yeah. aren't they? Within um, six months. That was probably one of my favourite, um, how can I say it politely, <laughs> toilet visits uh, at a pub uh, for some time. Uh, it felt particularly kind of... Um, Poignant. Poignant, yes. Yeah. Poignant is a good word. I have a sense, you know, whatever they do with it, I've got a feeling that's going to be a sort of thriving community pub. Yes, that's, I that's think the so. The sense I get. I wish them. I wish them well. I wish them well. I think the landlord is definitely thinking about his his regulars and the way that the uh, the pub goes from here. So um, yeah, we wish them well. Here's polar bear. Next up, venerable coaching in the White Hart Hotel. What would it be? Well, there would have been stabling here, wouldn't there, Tweedy? Yeah. The stabling would have been beyond free. here. Um, coach parking, stabling. It's all very open out at the. There's not so much of a courtyard sense now, is there? It's very open out at the far end. I presume end. that there would have been. Yeah, more of a courtyard. Oh, yeah. 
But this is nice. Look. Yeah. Oh. When does the current building date to? Tudor times, I think late 15th century. Late. Henry the Seventh. Right. So I that's believe. 1485 yes. onwards. Late, that's late, sort of late, era. 14, late 1400s, yeah. Yeah, late, late 15th century, probably in the time of Henry the Seventh. Well, if you look around cathedral cities in England, they often have coaching inns close by. And I think this is a good example of that. that uh, St Albans Cathedral today claims that St Albans is the earliest site of British pilgrimage. So presumably for some part of the history of this coaching inn, it would have been accommodating pilgrims coming to worship at the site of St Albans martyrdom. And I think we've got another car. <laughs> we have to move for the car, sorry. This is the, the dining room, I suppose now, at the back. There's a lot going on, isn't there? Here, but I think the panelling is probably. Do you, do you remember Tweedy? What it what they said? It's an early twentieth century. I would mean, say. Yeah, it? it looks it. Yeah, but it's nice. Though. It I, is I think nice. it's, it's sympathetic. You yeah, know? it is um, very nice. Oh. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers from the uh, the white part. Yeah, I'm a little bit self conscious. Yeah, sitting in the throne. I feel quite at home. Okay. <laughs> yes, this is how you're seated here at this moment. Yeah, yeah, I just have a tweed sofa, it's a bit, a bit more modest. But you, you seem to sort of you seem to relax into it a, a lot more than. Um, I feel very Tudor. Yeah, well, that would be appropriate. Yes. I think it might be filming us uh, having this conversation. <laughs> so, uh, what was uh, Sir Sir Lord Lover? What was what was he? A Scottish aristocrat that was sympathetic to the Jacobite cause. Right. That I was see. sort of well, that was enough court, reason to yeah, yeah and, and put on trial, but all the way down in London. So I think mm. that's part of the kind of humiliation was kind of being brought back to London, you dragged down to London. Um, yeah. uh, but en route, he well, probably legitimately was ill or claimed to be ill. He was um, allowed to rest here. At the White Hart in right. and it happened Hogarth was in the area very conveniently. <laughs> Just hanging right. around as yeah. Hogarth does and Hogarth did a quick portrait of him. But it's a very um, it struck me as a, it made him look very like the bad guy and you know, yeah. why, why would Lord Lovett have agreed to have his portrait yeah. done when he was It wouldn't have been a priority for him, I guess. The White Hart was uh, heavily restored in around 1935 and uh, the panelling that you can see in the two front bars and the rear bar, which doubles as a reception, we believe dates to that uh, 1935 uh, work. The White Hart is of course a heraldic device and it's commonly associated with Richard II. But what's interesting is, uh, particularly for a pub in this case, which was likely established probably a hundred years after the end of Richard II's reign, is that it continued to be used. Richard yeah. II was deposed. He was deposed. So the fact that people continued to use a name that was inextricably linked with his reign is interesting. The theory is that it's, it became a generic name like Hoover. Hopefully that's been a, a, a slightly informative tour of the pubs of St Albans. Uh, it's, been it's been two, it's been four enjoyable pubs I think and surprising. I don't know whether that's something that I was mistaken about with St Albans but we've seen four individual independent pubs haven't we? There's been a lot of character. They've, um, of note is the fact that they, they have all been independent yeah. as far as we're aware, all been free, house, free houses and all you know, non pub co, non brewery tied pubs. We've walked past some Farrow and Ball sort of type of places, yeah. haven't we? But uh, yeah. um, I know, I think it's been really surprising and enjoyable. Good. Right, well, thanks for watching. We'll uh, see you on the next. Stay tuned. I, I just wanted to record a quick addendum to that video. That was in fact my first ever YouTube collab, which was really exciting. I had a very fun day out in St Albans with WC21 UK Productions Limited, making both that pubs video. And we also recorded earlier in the day, a video about the Roman history of St Albans or Verulamium. So I'm going to put links everywhere I can possibly put links down here, up there, up there in the description 
to WC21 UK Productions Limited video about St Albans featuring me as well. So if you have any interest in history or just want to watch something a bit different on YouTube, I think his channel is excellent. It's really fun. It's really well made. Again, thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.